It is January 10th, and 54 years ago today, NASA's Surveyor 7 landed on the moon. It was the last landing for a program that was vital to America's Apollo program, the effort to place a man on the moon. The Surveyor program represented America's first successful lunar landing, and the some 87,000 pictures that were sent home from a Surveyor spacecraft dramatically improved our understanding of Earth's closest neighbor and only natural satellite. While the program is little remembered today, the Surveyor program was at one point a critical part of the Cold War contest called the Space Race that deserves to be remembered. The competition that would come to be known as the Space Race officially began in the summer of 1955, when representatives of both the United States and the Soviet Union publicly announced their national intent to launch artificial Earth satellites in the near future. The Space Race came to characterize the period called the Cold War. Competition over achievements in space exploration came to represent the competing economic systems and ideologies of the United States and the Soviet Union, with the resulting national prestige affecting geopolitical conflicts, both hot and cold, throughout the world. The space race was certainly more than about science, the primary tools of space exploration. Rockets were the delivery system for nuclear bombs, as well as to place satellites with a host of applications, both commercial and military. In fact, among all the various interests driving national investments in space exploration, science was often pushed surprisingly to the back. And yet, almost despite itself, the scientific endeavor of exploration managed to accomplish actual science, with a host of Soviet and U.S. programs that studied the Earth, near-Earth planets, solar phenomena, and our closest neighbor, the Moon. A significant milestone in the space race came on October 4, 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial Earth satellite, surprising the administration of Dwight Eisenhower. The concern raised in the U.S. of the Soviets beating the Americans into space has come to be called the Sputnik Crisis, a preliminary evaluation presented to Eisenhower and dated October 16th concluded. Public opinion will, for a period that cannot be forecast, be narrowly assessing the relative military positions of the U.S. and the USSR, and the USSR will, in this same period, have a clear advantage in the Cold War, which it can exploit for either peaceful gestures or ventures in increased pressures, or both, simultaneously. Perhaps most disturbing to Eisenhower was that the U.S. had the capability to launch a satellite much earlier, but chose not to. In a memorandum of a conference with the President dated October 9th, Donald Quarles, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, admitted to Eisenhower that there was no doubt that had the Redstone rocket being developed for military use been used, the U.S. could have orbited a satellite a year or more ago. But, the Secretary explained, the Science Advisory Committee had felt that it was better to have the Earth satellite proceed separately from military development. One result of the crisis was a shift in how the U.S. pursued space exploration. On January 14, 1958, the director of National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the U.S. federal organization responsible for undertaking and promoting aeronautical research, wrote in a report that, It is of great urgency and importance to our country, both from our consideration of our prestige as a nation as well as military necessity, that the challenge of Sputnik be met by an energetic program of research and development for the conquest of space. It is accordingly proposed that the scientific research be the responsibility of a national civilian agency. In April, Eisenhower proposed the creation of a national civilian space agency that would take over the assets of the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, that would expand the organization's research role to include large-scale development, management, and operations. The agency thus created by the resulting act of Congress was the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. A primary focus of the new administration was manned spaceflight. There was so much activity in space exploration between the launching of Sputnik and the first manned mission to the moon with Apollo 11 in 1969 that sometimes the multiple programs seem to get lost in the mix, nearly forgotten by the societies who funded them. And one of those was NASA's Surveyor Program, the first American spacecraft to successfully make a soft landing on an extraterrestrial body. Yet the $469 million program was at one point a critical part of the space race and a necessary part of the process of trying to safely land a human on the face of the moon. The Surveyor program was highly impacted by another Soviet first. On April 12, 1961, the Soviet Union again surprised the United States and the world when it announced that it had launched pilot Yuri Gagarin into space, where he completed an orbit before being safely returned to Earth. The Soviets had beaten the objective of America's Mercury program, 
Newly elected President John Kennedy, who had been lukewarm on the priority of spending for space exploration, embarrassed by the Soviet successes as well as under political pressure following the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, decided that there was a political need for the United States to demonstrate our technical superiority in space. Consulting with Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who was chairman of the National Aeronautics and Space Council, NASA leadership, and other experts, Kennedy sought a goal in space exploration that there was a realistic chance the U.S. could achieve before the Soviet Union. The conclusion was that the U.S. had no chance of placing a station in space ahead of the Soviets, were unlikely to be able to have a manned mission to orbit the moon ahead of the Soviets, but the U.S. had a reasonable chance of being able to place a human on the moon ahead of the Soviets. Such a program, however, would be expensive. NASA Administrator James Webb estimated a cost of $22 billion. In May, the President proposed to Congress that the United States should commit itself to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth before the end of the decade. The nation was unconvinced. Many considered the space race to already have been lost. Others saw better use of the billions of dollars it would cost, and still others objected that the civilian effort was getting in the way of military development. Still, Kennedy's goal of placing a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s would direct national efforts. In a speech on national space policy at Rice University on September 12, 1962, he famously said, We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Kennedy's goal would have a significant impact on a program that NASA had started investigating the previous year. The Surveyor program had been started by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the spring of 1960. It was an ambitious program that originally envisioned 17 missions to land robotic spacecraft on the moon. Aerospace historian William Melberg explained in 2014, It was originally envisioned as a scientific probe designed to answer some of the long-standing questions about the origin and nature of the moon. Projects of air would include orbiters and landers, the former intended to map the moon in unprecedented detail, and the latter designed to investigate its surface. But the mission of the program changed with Kennedy's goal. Melberg continues, When President Kennedy committed the United States to a manned lunar mission by the end of the decade, Surveyor soon became a supporting player in the Apollo program, blazing a trail to the moon for future astronauts. The 2020 book, The Surveyor Program, The History and Legacy of NASA's First Successful Moon Landing Missions by Charles River and Editors, explains the goals of the program. To prove that the lunar surface was a place where a landing could safely be made. To show that a spacecraft could reliably be launched from Earth and reach a defined destination on the moon. And to prove that guidance and descent systems could reliably and safely land a spacecraft on the surface of the moon. The first goal was more vexing than you might imagine. Melberg explains that his father, Frank Melberg, was responsible for the development of a sophisticated zoom lens for the surveyor landers. He quoted his father, I soon realized that nobody really knew what the moon's surface was like. I was told that some scientists believed the surface might be volcanic rock, rugged and hard. Others said that the material would have the consistency of Portland cement, powdery but firm, and a few thought that surveyor might sink into 12 feet of loose dust. The surveyor was not just a test for landing systems, but a test of a fundamentally important question. Was the surface of the moon actually capable of supporting a spacecraft? Melberg continues, The experts were still arguing amongst themselves about what we could expect to find on the moon because the biggest telescopes on Earth were unable to resolve any detail smaller than a quarter of a mile in diameter. In fact, surveyor was not the first program intended to discover the nature of the moon's surface and determine whether it was suitable for landing a manned spacecraft. The $100 million Ranger program had started launching probes in August of 1961. Unlike Surveyor, the Ranger program was not testing capabilities of a soft landing. Rather, the Ranger probes would simply crash into the moon. While the probe would be destroyed on impact, before crashing it would transmit detailed close-up images of the lunar surface. Rangers 7, 8, and 9 had successfully sent back photos of potential landing sites. But the photos weren't enough, as the Surveyor program notes. The pictures provided by the Ranger spacecraft were very helpful, but they didn't actually prove that it would be possible to land on the moon. While the photos showed that the potential landing sites were indeed flat and not craggy volcanic rock, Ranger could not answer the question of whether the surface was comprised of a layer of dust that might bury a spacecraft. Perhaps most distressing, though, was the fate of the first five Ranger probes. Probes 1 and 2 had suffered launch failures and burned up as they re-entered the atmosphere. NASA had lost control of Probe 4, which crashed without transmitting any pictures. Ranger 6 landed as expected, but the cameras malfunctioned. Rangers 3 and 5 had simply missed the moon 
altogether, leaving in doubt the Surveyor Program's goal of proving that a spacecraft could reliably be launched from Earth and reach a defined destination on the Moon. The Surveyor Program was significantly more complex than the goals of the Ranger Program. The Surveyor Program was testing whether a spacecraft could be softly landed on the Moon, intact. Of course, something that would be critically important if we wanted to send a manned mission, and something far more difficult than simply crashing a spacecraft into the Moon. And yet, two-thirds of the Ranger spacecraft had failed to successfully do even that. And then, as the mission was nearing its first launch, the Russians surprised us once again. On February 3, 1966, months before the first surveyor probe was scheduled to launch, the Soviet Union announced that its Luna 9 mission had successfully made a soft landing on the Moon and had transmitted back panoramic pictures from the surface of the Moon. The surveyor program notes this was devastating news. Many designers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory wondered if the surveyor program was a step too far. And yet the Soviets, who most Americans thought were not as advanced in their technology, had already done so successfully. Were the Soviets actually closer to a manned mission to the moon than the United States? Certainly the imperative for a successful surveyor launch was greater than ever. The launch vehicle for the surveyor program was the Atlas Centaur. Each spacecraft weighed approximately 650 pounds, and around 10 feet tall. The scent would be controlled by the burst of a solid-fuel retro rocket and then by small hydrazine engines controlled by Doppler radar. The engines would cut out about 10 feet above the lunar surface, and the craft would glide down. Constructed of aluminum tubing, the tripod-shaped craft's legs included shock absorbers to absorb landing impact. Strain gauges sent telemetry back to Earth to assess the force of the impact. Each spacecraft could include a solar panel and a battery and were designed to be able to carry an array of scientific instruments as well as state-of-the-art video camera capable of taking both 200-line and 600-line resolution pictures and other scientific payloads. The surveyor program notes, To achieve a controlled descent to the lunar surface without human intervention while a quarter of a million of miles away would mean taking 1960s technology to its very limits. The surveyor spacecraft, in addition to representing an important step on the way to the Apollo missions, was at the time the most advanced vehicle ever created. Surveyor 1 was launched at 10.41 a.m. on May 30, 1966. The program had faced significant technical obstacles. A program director for Hughes Aerospace, the contractor that had built the spacecraft, had told a reporter that odds were a thousand to one against a successful landing. With NASA and the nation in desperate need of a success in the space race, the launch was picture perfect. And after a trip of some 250,000 miles, approximately 63 hours and 30 minutes after takeoff, playing live on national television, Surveyor 1 landed successfully, the first soft landing of an American spacecraft on an extraterrestrial body. Surveyor 1 transmitted a total of 11,240 photographs and acquired data vital to the Apollo program on the radar reflectivity of the lunar surface, bearing strength of the lunar surface, and spacecraft temperatures for use in the analysis of the lunar surface temperatures. While there was some question whether the craft would withstand the extreme temperatures of a single lunar night, it continued to send and receive data well past its anticipated lifespan until January 7, 1967. America and NASA had an unqualified success on live television. Surveyor 7, the last of the Surveyor Program craft, landed 54 years ago today. Despite some difficulties with equipment, the craft was able to conduct all its experiments, including surface sampling to determine the major elements of the lunar surface. The mission is considered to be a complete success. It was later revealed that the Soviet Luna 9 probe had used an inflatable balloon at the end of the landing in order to cushion the spacecraft's landing. While that allowed the first soft landing on the moon, it was never a practical system that could have been used for a manned program. That is to say, the Soviets were farther away from a successful manned mission to the moon than the Americans realized. In November 1969, Apollo 12 landed close enough to the landing site of Surveyor 3 that astronauts could walk to the spacecraft and recover parts from it that were then used to determine effects of two and a half years of exposure on the Moon's surface. NASA launched seven Surveyor spacecraft, five of which had successful missions. Surveyors 2 and 5 crashed after technical difficulties. In all, the five successful missions operated on the Moon for a total of 17 months, conducting important scientific experiments and investigating the chemical composition of the surface of the Moon. Surveyor spacecraft managed a number of important firsts, including the first astronomical observations from the surface of the Moon, the first color images of the Earth from the Moon, and the first chemical analysis of lunar soil. Apollo 17 astronaut Harris Schmidt said of the Surveyor program, Each of them was critical to the development of the Apollo spacecraft and equipment. Project Surveyor removed any doubt that it was possible for an American 
to land on the moon. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguy.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.